Let's get into it. Soul Not For Sale podcast. Coach Colin here. An update on Maui. Tulsi Gabbard. Obviously, she has feet on the ground when it comes to Maui. When it comes to Hawaii, she's from there. She she stays engaged with the whole the whole state, but also especially Maui and what's been going on there. She gives Joe Rogan an update and actually reveals something that I was hoping wasn't true about the text messages between the people in charge that were supposed to be the emergency response people, the man who decided not to sound the alarms when the fire started. His text messages were released with one of his employees at the time. And it's terrible, man. Absolutely terrible. Let's get into it. Don't forget about the new channel I got. There's a link in the description. Coach Colin Media. We got 67 videos up already, and it will be 69 by the time I am done tonight. We're not playing around on that channel. It's where I break away from the Rogan content. Hit that subscribe button. But otherwise, let's get into the Rogan content. Let's bring down that speed for everybody. We're back. So we were just about to talk about Maui. Yes. So what what is going on right now post fires? No one is rebuilding homes yet. The remediation effort is still underway. And the biggest challenge for the families who were directly impacted by that, who were left homeless, is the fact that they they still don't have anywhere to go. You know, they've been put up in um, Airbnbs or in hotel rooms for a period of time. On Maui, the hotels are like, hey, we, we need to be able to start welcoming in tourists back into to, uh, the island. And uh, so the governor is trying to work out a plan to be able to provide some form of semi-permanent housing for people. If they were to try to go out and rent a house on the market, it is, it is purely unaffordable. And there are a number of families who are now faced with the tough decision of, do we just pick up and go and move our life out of Hawaii and to the mainland, which is heartbreaking. Uh, given how many of those families, I mean, they've been in that community in West Maui or in Lahaina for generations. What is happening with the people that had mortgages? So if they had a mortgage and their home was burnt down and they haven't gotten money from the insurance company and they haven't been able to rebuild, do they still have to pay that mortgage while this is all going on? You know, I haven't heard that raised as an issue. I would hope that the mortgage company would recognize what's going on, but it, that, that's, that's, some, that's a good question. I haven't heard it raised as an issue from either residents or as part of the conversation around um, housing for and them. why has no one been able to rebuild? There has to be, um, they, they, there, are, there are so many layers of toxins in the ground that have to be cleaned up and removed before people can go in and actually start, start to rebuild. But to speak of just the, the inspection and the permitting process and so forth. So the layers of toxins just from the fire? From the fire. And, you know, you had like a gas station with underground fuel tanks that burned like completely to ash on the ground. Um, the toxins that came from all, you know, different construction and, and everything else that exists in the environment. So all that stuff burns. It gets in the soil. It gets rained on. So the, the ground is contaminated. Right. And this is the reason why they can't rebuild? Yeah. And, and they knew from the outset it was, it was a known fact that it would take... I mean, to, if, if it only takes a year, that that is a, an expedited timeline, is and what I've been told. How long has it been now? Uh, August will be one year. August 8th. <sighs> the, the most insulting thing was the $700 one-time oh. payment from the government. Like, yeah. that is, who said yes to that? Who allowed that? You, at the, and at the same time, releasing this number where they accidentally had sent Ukraine $6 billion. Remember that? Yeah, they said, oh, well, we, we lost track of this $6 billion, and so now that we've found it because of some accounting error, now we can go and send it to Ukraine. And they were automatically assuming they were going to send that anyway. Of oh, course. Anymore. Of Don't course. Worry. But of course. no consideration at all. No, it, it, you know, I, I remember specifically when the fires had just happened, the White House brought in the director of FEMA to talk to the White House press corps, and someone asked the question, what are you, FEMA, what are you actually doing for the people who've been impacted by this tragedy? And the director stood there with a straight face uh, and proudly said, well, we have provided a one-time payment of $700 to, to uh, everyone who has been impacted by this fire or displaced by this fire. And that was her big announcement that she was there to make. One single one-time payment of $700. So that means you have 700 servings of ramen. <laughs> basically. <laughs> basically. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't even rent a bedroom in someone's house for $700. It's, it's so, just... It's, it certainly you can't for... Eight months. No. That's what's crazy. No. $700 is so crazy. It's just such an insulting and ridiculous number. And the fact that they haven't given more. Like, 
but yet they're flying people around on airplanes that come in illegally through the border? Yeah. Just like, how much yeah. does that cost? Yeah, exactly. What, what does that program cost? Exactly. Like, what does that cost? Multi-billions of dollars, if I had to, if I had to guess. It's, um, you know, FEMA has other services. It's a lot of bureaucracy. It's a lot of paperwork. And residents on Maui, they were being told, like, okay, well, hey, if you accept this kind of aid from FEMA, you are ceding some sense of your sovereignty or decision-making ability uh, with regard to your land or your property. And all of these, all of the red tape, essentially, that that caused a, a people, a community, who were rightfully skeptical about government coming in and saying, okay, well, we're going to help you when that same government said, oh, yeah, hey, we may at that time, and the governor the governor said this, and then he corrected himself later on, but he's like, oh, yeah, we're thinking about and talking about how we can turn this entire place, uh, have the government take ownership of it and turn it into some kind of memorial or some kind of workforce housing, which obviously made people really freaking mad to say, yeah. like, well, who the hell are you to come in here and say, you're just, you're just going to take our land? You're just going to yeah. take it and it's do crazy. what you want with it? So they're, they're obviously very skeptical and, and rightfully so about, you know, the fine print what does it mean if I accept a few bucks here or there from the federal government? What what power am I ceding to you to determine my future, the future of my family and our home? And unfortunately, the rest of the country has forgotten about it. By and large, yeah. Yeah, there's always a new thing in the news. There's always yeah. a new thing to pay attention to. There's always yeah. a new fear. One of the things that, that has just recently come out, first of all, the Maui Police Department, they did an audit of what went wrong, what did we do wrong, what should we have done better and kudos to them for actually doing this. And I think they came up with like 92 recommendations on things that needed to be fixed. They shared that with municipalities all across the country as like, hey, here are the hard lessons that we learned. You guys should take note and try to protect yourselves from having to go through what we went through. Um, other agencies at the county level and at the state level have not been so honest or transparent about their shortcomings. And the most egregious one recently that our local news in Hawaii exposed was the head of Maui's emergency response division. He was off island that day. He was at, a, a, of all places, a FEMA conference on Oahu when the fires happened. Mm. And instead of doing what any compassionate and responsible person and leader would do, you immediately get on the first plane out. You get a notification there, this, you know, this fire is happening on Maui. I got to be there with my people and I got to lead my teams to respond to this emergency. He, it took him a few days to go back to Maui, first of all. But the thing that was, and, and I don't know if you can find this, uh, Jamie, but they released his text exchanges that he had with his assistant uh, who was telling him, and he's like, what's going on with the fire, LOL, and the, the assistant responding saying, ha, 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 this place is like a circus. Their their exchange was so, so disturbing, doesn't even put it lightly, when you know there are people who are being burned to ash, burned alive in their community and their text exchange is like, oh, ha, 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 is the fire still going? LOL, yup, now it's going in another place. I, I couldn't I couldn't believe it uh, when I read it. And this was the same guy, Herman Andaya is his name. He uh, he didn't show up and, and show his face publicly until like seven days after the fire. And then he went and he did one press conference and then he quit and resigned. But there has not yet, and, and I hope investigations are ongoing, there has not been any kind of accountability at, at, at the various failure points uh, that that existed in this response. If the government wanted to take over that land, the best way to do it is to drag this out and make it so that people Exactly, quit. have no other choice. They have nothing to do. They can't do anything. Yeah. And they just tell stories about it. You know, yeah. I used to, we used to own that land. Right. There's a, a Native Hawaiian leader, famous <laughs> surfer, um, navigator for the Hokulea and traditional Hawaiian navigation, Archie Kalepa. Uh, he has been one of the most stalwart leaders for the community during this whole period in time, organizing emergency response and food and shelter and, you know, community gatherings. People come and play music at the end of the day throughout this whole crisis period and has been leading the charge. He's very well respected in the community in holding that line and saying we are not giving up our land. But as you said, it becomes a much more difficult argument to make when people, you got to live. Yeah. You got to be able to make sure your kids have what they need to go back to school and, and, and all of it. And how can you do that when you're in a constant state of, of transition with no real timeline where they're, they're not coming and saying, okay, hey, you can go and start rebuilding on this date. Right. So they're going to have to do well, some to speak sort of the of cost. I mean, right. uh, like a, uh, building a house from scratch. Right. Crazy. Most people don't have that money. No. Yet. And then Man, it is wild. The one thing throughout this that I would ask you to remember is one thing Joe Rogan said. If the government wanted the land, this would be the way to do it. 100%. Now, what I'm going to play for you is someone interviewing 
the governor of Hawaii, and he's talking about a fund that they're putting out there that's $175 million. And you would think that's a great thing. It's fantastic. But like Tulsi brought up, it comes with strings. So <laughs> it's it's so crazy what they're able to just pull off right in front of our eyes, like 53 million to the people of uh, to the legal immigrants in New York, 70 million on top of 52 or 51 million in Chicago going to illegal immigrants on top of almost 200 million that they spent prior to that. It's just the the numbers are so crazy. And these people need a f they need a, you know obviously it's a, it's a huge number but small in in the sense of what we're talking about. They need a few billion dollars. They need like 10 billion dollars. And they can't come up with it. And instead, the governor does this. Again, remember what Joe said. If they wanted the land, there's ways that they could go about it. And I don't know if they're acting in the best faith right now. Listen to this. Residents are now being allowed back into Lahaina, but the governor has warned them that they're going to see destruction like they have never seen in their lives. And from what we can see up here, he's telling the truth. Down there, there's the grip search for bodies happening right now. Those that could not escape. And the residents of Lahaina believe that the death toll is going to be much higher. That was part of our reporting in the skies over Maui just days after those deadly wildfires in Hawaii last August. This Friday marks seven months since those deadly blazes ripped through the town of Lahaina, leaving a massive trail of destruction in their wake. The horrifying images now ingrained in our memories. You see them here, flames engulfing homes and tearing through businesses, residents forced to jump into the ocean or even a pool to escape. The aftermath, a chilling portrait of absolute devastation. Drone images capturing the charred remains of entire neighborhoods lost in the blaze. Cadaver dogs searching the ashes for remains. More than 100 people lost their lives and nearly seven months later, two people are still missing. We were on the ground in the days that followed, talking to members of the Lahaina community, struggling to come to terms with the destruction in front of them. I'll never forget their stories of survival and loss, but also being in the middle of a place that is paradise, and at that time, hell. Grief for those lost quickly turning to rage as Hawaiians asked why they weren't warned about the dangerous fire as it closed in. The state's emergency management administrator, Herman Andaya, stepping down days after the disaster, after defending his decision not to sound alarms, which some believe could have saved dozens of lives. Now, months later, residents fighting to return to some sense of normal, but slowing tourism and an exploding housing crisis are still exasperating the fire's impact. Joining us tonight on Top Stories Spotlight is one of the leaders in the ongoing recovery efforts, maybe the most important, you could argue, Hawaii Governor Josh Green, he joins Top Story tonight from Hawaii. Governor, thanks for joining Top Story. I, I'm sorry to have to sort of put you through that because I know you're living with it every single day. And it is all so sad. I mean, just, just reading that copy and sort of reliving in my mind what we saw there. Um, it's been seven months. There, there's still been no clear timeline of what happened. And still no one has sort of taken ownership of this terrible thing that happened in Lahaina. Seven months later, do you know who to blame? Uh, I don't place blame on any one group. Uh, we know that the fire started early in the morning, was put out and then reignited and spread with extremely high winds. That's really what happened. Uh, the winds were 74 miles per hour. And so it spread the fire very quickly, faster than fire could even respond. Uh, we do have a pretty clear picture minute by minute of who was able to get out and who couldn't. The heroic work of the police and fire to the extent that they could save people. And we now know, of course, that there were 101 loved ones that we lost. So uh, the final reports will take years, but um, the preliminary reports do show that the fire started when polls went down and uh, everyone did what they could in the moment uh, to put the fires out. There were several fires that day, of course. And so the firefighters had to move from region to region on Maui to actually put other yeah. fires out. They were stretched thin. Tragedy, no doubt. Governor, yes. you know, you mentioned the polls and a lot of people have put blame on the power company there, Hawaiian Electric. There have been several lawsuits. Do you blame Hawaiian Electric? Do they do they hold some of the responsibility here? Uh, everyone's going to take a part of the responsibility. And that includes uh, 
the energy company that includes the state and those who owned land around there. So I actually proposed a way to begin to help people heal. That is what we call um, really a settlement fund or the Maui Recovery Fund. So we put together $175 million to offer if, if people would like to take uh, at least the beginnings of monies to help move on. Uh, but I'm sure there will be a lot of litigation and that's appropriate. That's I do, do want to ask you, I, I do want to ask you about that fund. Um, and the way that we understand it works is that families can, can tap into these funds. But if they receive the funds, they agree not to sue some of the underwriters. And one of the underwriters is Hawaiian Electric. Do you think that's fair that families that need this aid, they need, they need the support, get that money, but then they cannot further lawsuits if, if they lost loved ones or lost their homes? Well, that's the nature of these kind of settlements. And I wouldn't put any pressure on anyone if if they want to wait and litigate. That's totally appropriate and OK. This is just so people can move on now rather than waiting three or four years. Uh, some people ask me, do I think that the state is liable? I just say that we're all responsible. You know, resp we're responsible to help people get better and heal. Several people in the first few hours of us opening the fund, uh, they jumped on it. We call it the One Ohana Fund. People should know the word Ohana means family here in Hawaii. Uh, there's nothing fair about losing a loved one or losing one's home, uh, but we want people to recover. And then there's going to be, of course, settlements over land because we had 3,991 um, buildings destroyed and we had over 3,000 families that, that lost everything. So we want to take care of everyone. That is what I want to do as a, a governor. Uh, but there's a long road ahead of us. Natural disasters. Man, that is wild. That is wild. So, because you have to think of it, that $175 million, they're holding that like a carrot in front of these people. These people know that there are certain people who are responsible. There's a man who didn't sound the alarm when the fires were taking place. And then there is a, there is a company, I believe he said Hawaiian Electric, which they are responsible for the poles. And apparently the poles fell and that started the fire. And they're making it so they can call none of those people into question. And again, exactly what Joe said, make this take long enough. It's been, what, eight months? Eight months. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, there's $175 million fund and you can get part of that fund and you just agree not to sue. And also, just to let you know, you can't build on your land. So what's going to happen with the money? <laughs> like, it, it's, it's nuts. What's going to happen with the money? They're going to get that money. They're going to have to use it to live. Then by the time that they're able to build on their land, what money are they going to have to do that? And again, how much money has been spent? I would like to know. I would like to know nationwide how much money has been spent on illegal immigration, on the illegal immigrants who have come through. I wonder how much money has been spent. You have to think about it. If there's been 8.2 million that we know of, getaways you can't calculate getaways someone's like oh there's been 1.9 million getaways how do you know they got away <laughs> they got through they didn't have to talk to anybody you have no idea how many but 8.2 that we know of and each one of them is getting what what was it it's a debit card a thousand bucks something like that i don't know man <laughs> uh it's uh, cell phones alone just think of what the cost of the cell phones are you know, the cell phones that are for tracking purposes. Okay. But you give them money too. So they just throw that phone in, just throw that phone away and they just buy a new iPhone and they're just on their way making TikToks about squatting. You know, it's, uh, it's wild. And that, that's a real thing. I'm not making that up. I'm not, I'm not putting that on all these, these people that really happened. There was really someone who was an illegal immigrant and he made videos telling people how to squat. He really did that. He's arrested now. But just think about what are they going to do? They're going to get to a point where now you can build on your land. They're going to have no money and they're just going to have this land. And then what's going to happen? Well, you can sell it to whoever is going to step in, whether it be the government or some high end people trying to build resorts. <sighs> it's sad what they're doing to these people. You know, you would think that the government, you know, at least this governor, you think he'd be able to step in. And say, 
listen, if the governor of New York can be like, hey, we're taking $53 million and we're buying everybody debit card, we're getting everybody debit cards who came here illegally, so they have some walking around money. If if he's able to do that, this guy should be able to go beyond a fund and just be like, we'll treat these, let's just treat these people like illegal immigrants and let's just put a quarter billion dollars into just housing them, having them have somewhere to live, removing the toxic debris that's on their land, a, a plan on how to build back their homes. It's very clear through what I've just heard and through what I'm hearing that they don't want these people to get their land back. That's just like, I don't know what you're hearing. It sounds like they don't want, because what would you do otherwise if you were a good hearted person and you're in, in the position of a governor? You'd be like, we're going to do whatever we can to make sure this debris is moved and that your house is rebuilt as soon as possible. And listen, we won't be able to rebuild your house exactly how, but we have a we have a developer. These are the houses you'll be able to have. Pick one of these houses. It'll be ready in three years. We're going to put you up in a place for three years. Why can't that happen? Why can't that happen? It, see, it really seems like they don't want these people back in their land. And I understand it's a lot of money, but also it it's their people. More has been done for people who have gone through the border illegally than has been done for the people of Maui. It's just ridiculous. Here, let's listen to this as well, a little update piece. Now to Hawaii, where Maui residents are finally being allowed back to their properties in Lahaina. The town they're almost entirely destroyed by massive wildfires this summer. At least 97 people were killed by the flames and smoke last month. Jonathan Vigliotti shows us how locals are struggling to cope with all the grief. It's been nearly seven weeks since the Pagdilao family has walked around their hometown of Lahaina. Their painful first steps were made here at this memorial to pay respect to their patriarch, Pablo Pagdilao III, another name added to a long row of crosses, each one a family member lost to the Lahaina fire. The family ended their visit together in prayer, Amen. grateful for what is left. A lot of us have not actually been able to come back. To see someone go in an unexpected way, it, it kind of hurts. Pegdillo, who was partially paralyzed, died while trying to flee the fire by car with his wife, Nelda. The flames blocked their exit on Front Street, and Nelda couldn't carry her husband over the seawall to safety. When she went over the wall, she tried to pull him down, but unfortunately, um, the fire got really close, and my grandma did whatever she could. She did not give up, but my grandpa told her, go, just leave me. Just go find the family go, and go take care of yourself and them. Painful memories like this await many families who will be returning to what's left of their homes in Lahaina this week. The community gathered Sunday night to discuss recovery efforts. Cami Furtado was among those present. Uh, the sock store, the ice cream store. Furtado is a sixth generation Lahainen whose family owned about a dozen historic buildings on Front Street. Is it your family's commitment that you're going to keep this in the family instead of selling it off to some big developer? We will, that's our intent is to rebuild. And there will be a long road to recovery and rebuilding. The roadblock behind me will be lifted later on this morning. There are about 40 homes in this neighborhood. Most of them have been destroyed. Officials hope for those who do choose to return home to what little is left, they will find some sense of closure, Chanel. And wild, wild. I wasn't even ready for that story. I didn't get to listen to that one beforehand. That's a, oh man. <clears throat> but yeah, you know, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy as as the governor, again, to focus on the governor, because the reason there's a bit of disdain from people for him is because he suggested at first that it be turned into uh, or have, have a moratorium put on it. And with a moratorium, it makes it so the people that own the land can't sell it. So if a big developer did come and wanted to, to buy up the land, they wouldn't be able to do that, but it also makes it so the people can't rebuild. So, and then it gets to a point where the government would actually own it in a sense. And it was just, 
It was just all wrong. It was the worst thing that he could possibly suggest. Second worst thing is this fund where people get not nearly enough money to replace their land because it's premium land. If you were someone who wanted to build a resort, you'd want to build it there. So you're not even getting the equal amount because like they said in the videos, 3,000 families, 3,000 families lost everything, right? $175 million? That doesn't work out. That doesn't work out. So you're giving people not even what their land is worth and they need it to live. And again, you know, I don't want to talk in circles, but what what is that going to do for them? And pl oh, no, I can't forget the seven. Can't forget. Can't forget the seven hundred dollars they got as well. Sorry. Sorry about that. Never mind. Let's redo all the calculations. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, in this video, they're going to show a little more of the numbers. Here, let's get into that. And this week marks six months since fire tore through Maui, leaving the Hawaiian island devastated. Beaches and forests and homes left in ashes. ABC's Melissa Adan went back to see how the rebuilding is going. It was just six months ago when a massive inferno ravaged the historic district of Lahaina, which was once the capital of the Hawaiian kingdom, as well as a national historical landmark. Yeah, got it. gotta go. We're at least 100 died, three still missing, over $5.5 billion in damage, and more than 2,000 households remain displaced in one of Hawaii's worst disasters on record. About no later than 4 a.m. is when I begin my day. I have a rule, and I don't leave the office until every voicemail email has been dealt with. Insurance executive Mahialani Strong is a Lahaina native and on the front line of the work to rebuild. There's a lot of people that underbought insurance because they didn't plan for something like this to happen. She says the process of filing out a claim is a challenge. Imagine living in a home for 20 years and having to inventory everything you had in that home in order to collect your check. As of last December, more than 3,900 homeowners have filed insurance claims in the Maui fire, with nearly 1,600 of those properties suffering a total loss. Roughly 30% of claim money has not been paid, equal to more than $456 million. I think some of my biggest frustrations are fighting for what I believe they should be getting and getting a kickback or having to wait till it goes through a process. So, $5.5 billion, $400, we're basically talking about, again, $10 billion. They, they, in that whole bill that was first the border bill where more money was going to Israel and Ukraine that was going towards the border and then they just took out the border part and they just made this other bill that actually got passed where Ukraine got 60 billion I think Israel got about 15 to 20 billion and then there's some other nations that got some few billions I think it was like uh, Pacific Asian something like that. something like that where are the bills passing to fund what happened in Maui? Where are those? It It's a bill that would be $10 billion. $10 billion to take care of the people, to move the debris, rebuild their houses. I don't even know if it's $10 billion. Let, let's just say it's $20 billion. Where is the bill for that? So a bunch of people who are American citizens aren't displaced and screwed out of their land. Where <laughs> this is nuts. It's nuts, man. Because it's such a simple thing. It seems simple. Again, of course, I'm not a governor. I'm not I'm not in I, I don't actually know. But if you're showing me that you're effortlessly, well, not even effortlessly, I'll say tirelessly fighting to get money to Ukraine and Israel and Gaza as well, because Gaza gets funded as well. They've gotten almost I think it's like 1.5 billion dollars since biden's been in office something like that a lot of aid and some of it goes to hamas unavoidable they run the country in a sense right so uh, <laughs> if you're doing all that you have to be able to get money to the people of hawaii how could you not how how do you get money to foreign nations so so rigorously and so much and you can't just get money to, you know, am I, am I crazy? <laughs> it's, it's see, it seems simple. I don't get it. The border, 
Maui, the fentanyl crisis. How come these things can't just get taken care of? Again, this is the stance that people who are America first have. You know, they try to brand it as, you know, you don't want to be interventionist or right wing propaganda. That's exactly what MSNBC was saying. But just taking care of the issues at hand in your own nation. It's actually it's so it's so flabbergasting to me. I, I just how do you not help these people? And then again. The governor is like, we got a fund where if you take some money from us, you can't sue us. What? You just can't sue anybody. Yeah, we don't want you. You just shouldn't be able to sue anybody. Democrat, by the way. Democrat, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is the guy. You can see his name there. Herman. Herman and and, and, and Dea or something like that. This is the gentleman that decided that it would be a bad idea to sound the alarms when there is a fire that could possibly sweep through all of Lahaina like it actually did. He said he did not want to sound the alarms. He stood by that. (sighs) Has no training uh, as being somebody who's a part of an emergency management agency. Zero. Zero, ladies and gentlemen. None. His text messages were revealed like Tulsi was talking about. And uh, yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. You can see at the top here, a few of the messages. So uh, this is some lady named Gail messaging him. And she says, LOL, poor chief looks so overwhelmed. Chief is wanting help from the military. Not sure of what. She means for what. Then he says, that that's crazy. How is everyone holding up? I'm not coming back. I'm at a I'm at a thing. I'm just gonna chill. There's a fire sweeping through the whole place. Then he says, "Should I come home?" She says, "PIOs are so funny. There are three of them, and they look scared and overwhelmed. I think they need a hug. LOL to calm down. This is wild, <laughs> wild, wild that they're texting back and forth like this." Then he texts back later on after he's done his little convention. How how's the fire? How's the other fires? Like he's just asking about a day. She's just like, it's like he just said, "How are you?" And she's like, "Fine, still burning." Wow, lol. Does this guy not think he should arrive? I'm telling you, he had no training. He has no training. He doesn't understand the severity. He has zero training in this type of thing. Now we have I'm not sure how to say that. Kahi fire near Palua Road. And then he says, you keep making, you just keep making my day. And then at almost 11 o'clock, the Hawaii Emergency Management Administrator, James Burrows, says to him, LTJ or LTG just called very concerned. Yes, this is really bad. I'm flying back tomorrow. Wow, man, this guy's laughing about it. LOL. Wow. Wow, they're still burning. LOL. <laughs> and then and then and then does one press conference. I remember when I covered this. His press conference was so just ridiculous. Taking taking no responsibility whatsoever, even though he's the one that decided not to sound the alarms. And then after that press conference, he resigned. And he's like, oh, it's for personal reasons. It has nothing to do with the fact that this entire place burned down and I didn't sound the alarms to tell people and people passed away. That's not why. It's just personal other stuff that came up. It's just other things that came up. And again, like I said, zero, zero, absolute no. He was not an expert in emergency management when he was hired in 2017, DEI. It doesn't say that, but that's what I'm thinking. (laughs) <laughs> having a background in political science and law, but no formal education in disaster preparedness or response. Prior to his role at MIMA, he had never held a full-time job dedicated to emergency management. Yep, that's the guy. Wow, LOL. <laughs> and then and then he just stopped stopped working. 
wants to assume no responsibility and the governor's fine with all that did you notice i have to actually bring up really quick did you notice that the governor said oh you know we're all responsible he he even named people who owned land somehow that they're responsible i forgot to bring that up in that first clip i showed you he actually mentioned how even the people who own land you know even they're responsible a little bit this guy's just trying to spread the responsibility everywhere and then also not help it's so it's so it's so silly it's such a it's such a silly thing and again tucker's talked about this we, we keep talking about this how in in your face it is you know especially to the people in maui how in your face it is it's just like we're not helping you you know that that one thing that tucker brought up in that speech i covered it on my other channel that one thing that tucker brought up he goes even even a a leader that's like not educated you know could still be a good leader if they loved you the people in charge even if they just loved you they could still do things that would be right by the people because they love you but if they don't love you they are going to hurt you that is what's going to happen if they don't care about you like you hang around with a bunch of people who don't care about you at all you tend to stay away from people like that you don't feel safe around people like that Ugh, man it's wild anyways guys i just wanted to give you that little update and uh i'm gonna make sure to stay updated on what's going on with this fund and what actually happens with the people who take the money apparently they can't sue and we'll see in the next few months if there's even going to be a plan to rebuild remove the toxins anything so let me i'll, I'll let you guys know anyways like, subscribe, all that good stuff. I'm out.